forum where we are exploring a key aspect of the way higher education is changing. We're going to be looking at a major report and we're fortunate enough to have one of the authors and one of the experts. Um, but before we begin, I need to introduce you to the forum, where it comes from, how it works, how it's supported, and then we'll introduce this week's guests. Uh, so to begin with, um, you should know a few things about the forum and how it works. Uh, the one piece is that we are an outgrowth, the kind of video discussion outgrowth of the Future Trends Forum, uh, of the Future Trends and Technology and Education Report. If you haven't seen that, FTTE is a monthly trends analysis that takes a look at key developments in technology and education. We've been accumulating enough data over time so that we can try to extrapolate them forward to try and understand where education might be headed. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, go to ftte.us, download a few sample copies, and subscribe if you like. Now, what the forum is, this is the discussion-based version. This is where we're all about conversation uh, between participants, guests, and myself. We have very little in the way of presentation. The key thing here is conversation with people. Over the next slide, please, Tara. And again, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the Future Trends Technology Education Report, not only can you go to ftte.us, but you can use the hashtag FTTE to see discussion there. And in fact, this hour, the probably discussion about this very forum is on the hashtag. Over to the next one, please. Now, a key aspect of our work is that we take a look at the future of education and technology from as transnational perspective as possible. You can see from this map that we've had guests from just about every continent. And since we made this map, we've had guests from the continent that's left out, which is Africa. So we've had people from North America, South America, Middle East, Australia, Europe, Central Asia, and East Asia. It's vital to think about where learning and technology can go, to think about it as transnationally as possible. We hope to fulfill that here. Now, over the next slide, please. We hope to also thank people who support this work, uh, without which we can't do it. So to begin with, I want to thank NYSERNET from New York State. It's a nonprofit that works with that state's colleges, universities, libraries, and museums to get them online and get them to broadband. We're very grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, who provides a technology that we're using right now. Now, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it or use this, let me just quickly walk you through it. Because again, the key part about this forum is that it's conversation-based. And there are a lot of ways for you to converse. So right now, where I am and where these slides are, just for another minute, is called the stage. Everybody who's here can hear and see us up on the stage. Below us, you'll see many, many silhouettes or faces and pictures. So right now, I'm taking a look at uh, Don Banak, who is smiling at us through his glasses um, in Southern California, where he's enjoying probably sunny and warm temperatures. Uh, you can see lots of other people there. Each silhouette represents one person or one login. If you'd like to connect with a person, if you'd like to chat with them, simply double click on them. And if they're in a mood to talk, that is, if they feel friendly, but also if their microphone and camera work, your two silhouettes will click together. You'll have your own special video audio bubble so you can have a conversation. And we may just do that in a few minutes. Now, there are a lot of ways you can connect with us. And if you look at the very bottom of the screen, you can see a bunch. So there's a little white strip that runs across the bottom of the screen. Now on the left side, you'll see a bunch of interactive tools. So one of them is a list of participants. You can click that to get a sense of who's here. So you can scroll that and see one from Brenda to Jim to Gabriella. Next to that, you'll see a text chat box. If you click that, the chat box will pop up so that we can see, we can converse with everybody who's in this room. And by room, that means the roughly 16 or 17 people who've signed in so right now, the room where I started from, uh, there's James Murphy, Lisa Hinchliffe, Daniel Rossman, Catherine D., Don Manak, Joe, Mark Carnes, Mark Hubbard, Wilson, Kimberly, Let's Rob, Taylor, Kendall, Melissa Bend, and a bunch of other people. And already Greg and Mark are talking to each other. So please use that chat box if you'd like to just communicate with each other that way. And we'll bring that into the conversation. Now next to that white strip, you'll see a little kind of question mark with a circle around it, which is an ask button. If you have a question you'd like to ask or a comment you'd like to make, you can simply type it in there. And when the time is right, we'll flash it on the screen for everyone to see, and I'll read it out loud for everyone to hear. Now, if your camera works and your microphone works, and you're in a position where you can talk out loud, click the raised hand icon. That'll tell us you want to join us on stage. 
Now that sounds intimidating or hard. It's really not. You get to be up on stage, you get to enjoy me and the guests and ask us questions and converse back and forth. It's really easy to do, it's a lot of fun, and uh, I think it really realizes some of the potential of this medium. So those are three different ways that you can connect with each other, um, the guests and myself. Please use them over the next uh, 55 minutes or so. Now, we're grateful to Shindig for their support with this technology, but we're also grateful to dozens of other people on Patreon. So here, tear over to the next slide, please. Let me show you this. If you haven't seen it, Patreon is a crowdfunding project for creative people. But unlike, say, Kickstarter or GoFundMe, where people sign up to propel one project forward, instead you sign up to support one particular person as they do the work. And that person, in this case, is me, doing this work in the future of education. If you go to patreon.com slash Alexander, you'll see people who sign up to support as little as just a dollar a month just to keep the lights on and the machines humming along. And we're really, really grateful for them for their support. So that's the support. That's the technology. That's where the future transform comes from. On the next slide, let me introduce our guests from this week. We're really, really glad to have Rayan al Mudin and Robin Kelch because for a few reasons. One is that Rayan is the Ithaca SNR senior researcher who wrote this fantastic report we've been talking about. And Robert is a professor at Seton Hall University, and he is one of the experts that's interviewed. And I will get a chance to pick his brains about his opinions on this. So it's great to have these experts here. It's also great to have someone else here from Ithaca SNR. We have in the past connected with several different people, including Deanna Markham, the wonderful former leader of Ithaca SNR. And we're just grateful to connect all of you with that terrific New York City-based research project because they do such excellent and important work. So let's bring them up on stage. Uh, Tara, why don't you uh, wipe these slides away, bring up Brianne, and bring up Robin. Brianne, can you hear me okay? Yes, can you hear me? Perfectly. So glad to hear and see you. And Robert, Thank you. you're there? I can, I can hear you loud and clear. Excellent, excellent. Welcome both of you. Welcome to Future Transform. Really glad that you had the time today. Uh, and we really look forward to hearing your insights. Uh, just to begin with, uh, we sent people uh, information about who you are and, uh, and some of your backgrounds. But if you just tell us what you do and what you work on. Uh, so if, uh, Brian, why don't you start off? Sure. First off, thanks so much for having me here, Brian. And thank you, Robert, Pleasure. for joining me. Um, and just also just a quick acknowledgement to my colleagues, Martin Kurzweil and Daniel Rossman, who I work with on this project, but are not here yeah. right now uh, at the forum. So I'm, a, as you said, I'm a senior researcher at Ithaca SNR. We are a research and consulting nonprofit based out of New York. And in the educational transformation program, part of the organization where I work, we focus on um, conducting, disseminating information, generating information and supporting institutions in uh, efforts to help improve access to post-secondary education, lower costs and improve quality. And so some mm -hmm. of the work that I do is mixed methods research uh, in, different, in different areas. My focus is on program evaluation. So evaluating programs mm -hmm. that aim to do one of um, the goals of our mission. Cool. Very good to hear it, and uh, welcome. Are you in uh, New York right now? Yes, at our Excellent. offices. Excellent. Good. And Professor Kettle, tell us about yourself. I'm Robert Kelchin. I'm an assistant professor of higher education at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. And my work is on higher education finance, student financial aid, and accountability policies and practices. And I've got a new book on higher education accountability coming out. So when I was oh, offered a chance to, to be a part of the panel, it was just right up my alley. And I teach survey research methods as well. So that made it even more fun. Oh, so the two of you are perfect compliments to each other. That's great. <laughs> That's good. I was going to jump uh, in and say that Robert has a fabulous blog uh, that I think everyone should follow if you're interested in higher ed finance. Please. Oh, yes. Uh, if you could, uh, one of you, paste the URL into the chat box, then everyone can find that. And I'll ask you again at the end uh, for ways to keep up. Uh, Robert, when does your book come out? It comes out in January. It's available for pre-order now through Johns Hopkins University Press and on Amazon. And it's just called Higher Education Accountability. Excellent. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to it. Well, um, thank you both for uh, for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm 
glad that we can benefit not just from your research, but also from your perspectives uh, on uh, research methodologies, on program assessment and evaluation, uh, and as well as higher education finance, because this report delves quite a bit into finance. So let me just ask to begin with, um, looking at the report, uh, looking at all the 111 uh, people, leaders from across higher education and supporting associations, they seem to be very, very concerned with the federal government, which doesn't exactly make them outliers or alone right now. Um, they seem to be especially concerned that the new Secretary of Education is going to either uh, boost the uh, power of non of for-profit education, uh, or that they may harm some of the financial aid that students uh, are currently enjoying. Uh, can you speak to that one particular part of the report? I didn't hear the last thing you said, Brian, sorry. Can you speak to that particular part of the report about, uh, about the respondents' attitudes towards the federal government? Should I go ahead, Robert? Okay, just a, well, just a quick note, and this is, this is definitely Robert's area of expertise here, but I think, so this, I mean, it did not, it did not come as a surprise, I would say. Uh, I think what came as a surprise is with how much passion the respondents talked about this. I do think that um, given, especially this, this week, as we have, you know, the tax reform uh, measure going in to the Senate, that there's, these concerns are warranted, that there are changes, there's a direction that the current administration is taking uh, in terms of higher ed finance in general, not just scholarships or targeted, you know, finances for student, that students that uh, go, are not in line with what these experts are hoping or what has been in the past kind of a direction that the Department of Ed has been moving towards. So I think that these concerns are warranted and it, it's definitely in line with a, a general, um, kind of a general tone in all of the responses across the survey of very, very um, pointed concern about students' ability to afford college, to afford a good a, a degree to complete their degree in a timely way that will lead to gainful employment. And I think that is a major theme across the report. Yeah, I've heard that from quite a few policymakers right now, quite a few funding agencies um, as well. Um, Professor Kelchin, do you want to add to that? Sure, and I think it also hits a little bit on the political leanings of academia in general, that a number of people who responded to the survey likely either worked for or consulted with the Obama administration. But I think some of the fears have been realized and some not quite so much. We're, there's a congressional hearing this morning about simplifying the FAFSA. And then Secretary DeVos also announced this morning that as of next spring, students will be able to fill out the FAFSA on their mobile devices, which is a nice new thing. Mm. So, so there hasn't been any out of there hasn't been a mobile-friendly uh, FAFSA form yet? No, not yet. The federal government tends uh, to move a little bit slowly on these things. Yes, quite. quite. Um, so that's a pleasant surprise. Um, but yeah. beyond that, um, we, we come back to Rand's concerns, that, uh, um, or the concerns, Rand, that uh, your respondents reflected, uh, that uh, affordability and timely completion may be harder to achieve than before. Yes, I, I want to add something to what Robert just said. That in fact, that so when when the survey came out at toward the end of May, it was everything was still very new, and there's a lot of passionate responses. And like he said, that uh, academia in general tends to lean liberal, probably our panel as well. So there's definitely some there could be some positive outcomes or some of the fears that were not realized that were not highlighted, uh, or that kind of kind of go into the background. And I would say, for example, that some of the fears around. Uh, um, for, um, changes to, for example, uh, income-based repayment of loans and so on did not turn out for some to be as as bad or as scary as I thought they would be. So there's definitely that other side to the report that mm -hmm. doesn't make it quite in there. Uh, but the concern over affordability is this is a long-standing concern. Uh, this is definitely not something new at all. And there's a lot of work, definitely institutions at the institutional level, at the state level, there's work being done. But with the decrease in state appropriations over time, that continues to be a concern, even though the numbers have gone up some, not quite enough. And so there's multiple factors here at play, aside from federal policy, of course. Yeah, that's a really good point. We're going to come back to the uh, state question in just a minute. But let me just remind everybody participating uh, that if you would like to ask questions uh, of our guests, 
Uh, if you would like to uh, issue comments um, or to have any other thoughts, please use those different technologies that I've mentioned so far. Either click the raised hand button if you want to join us on stage, uh, click the question mark if you uh, want to type in a question to ask us all, or use the text chat box. Uh, and we've already had some text chat happening right now. The irrepressible Tom Haynes and the long standing stalwart Mark Corbett Wilson have been going back and forth already. Uh, so I have a whole stack of questions, friends. So please uh, don't don't let me uh, completely overrun this. Um, but Robert, you said something that really really struck me. Um, the the population that you surveyed may be politically predisposed to already not exactly be happy with the DeVos uh, department. Uh, Ryan, can can you speak to who actually answered uh, the survey? The 111 or so who completed it. Uh, they're mostly university and campus uh, leaders, presidents, deans, um, but also it's more complex than that, right? Yes. So just maybe to give you a little bit background on the panel, this is not a represent. This was not meant to be a representative panel. This is a select panel of experts based. Um, basically, what what happened is that we know from conversations, you get a group of experts together on higher ed who have experience, and fantastic ideas come out, really interesting perspectives come out. And we wanted to kind of encapsulate that and capture it a little bit and share it with the higher ed community. And so we contacted uh, experts that we personally know as Ithaca SNR or from uh, leaders of institutions that are innovative, that are doing something different, that are outspoken, uh, fantastic researchers such as Robert and others in higher ed who produce really important knowledge. And so we just, we cast a wide net. We did that twice. Uh, and then folks who responded and were willing or had the time and capacity joined our panel. And the panel is, as you said, it's mostly folks within uh, academic institutions. Uh, I would say about close to half are administrators, senior leadership, but we also have folks from foundations, philanthropies, um, uh, some policymakers as well, or folks who formerly were in the Department of Ed. But I would say mostly, mainly folks within academia. We have a nice mix. And a lot of the administrators are former faculty as well, so like seventy-five percent. Yes, I say most folks have taught a course at some point. Also, most individuals have been an administrator uh, in higher ed at some point, point. and they they have a wide range of experience in higher ed, from you know from three years to up to fifty-nine or sixty years of experience in the field. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. So I mean, this document is now, I think, a great historical snapshot of American higher education in twenty seventeen. Uh, especially earlier in the year. Oh, you mentioned uh, state support, and uh, we've had several different uh, guests before, including uh, Chris Newfield, who, uh, like uh, Robert, has published with Johns Hopkins University Press, who have made uh, extensive research into the decline of state support to higher education. And the decline dates from the early 1980s through a couple of years ago. Um, but in your report, you mentioned that some of the respondents are happy to see some recent turnabouts on that, where some states are actually increasing their funding for public higher education, and that the uh, respondents thought that that was a good thing, and we need more of it. Uh, is there anything to, to add to that? Or is there any, or are there any surprises in their responses? So I can speak to folks' responses, and I think Robert can say a lot more about this than I would. He actually piloted our survey and gave us some feedback on some of the items when it came to that, which was very helpful. Um, I would say, I mean, what, what was interesting for that item specifically, it sort of didn't matter if they thought it was positive or negative in terms of the impact. What mattered was, yeah. where is this going? So appropriations were low, appropriations are very important, they've increased, it's a good sign, we need much more of that. And a lot of, and I'd like to maybe come back to this point later, it's slightly off, but very linked to, they linked the idea of state appropriations to the public value of, of education. Is this a public good that we invest in that's a public investment, or is this a private good that's financed by, you know, by, by loan, debt finance? And so I think that discussion there around this is, a, is an interesting one to follow up on. It is. It is. Uh, Professor Kelchin, do you want to add to that? Yes, and it's worth noting that state appropriations have kept up with inflation over time, but they haven't kept up with that combination of inflation and enrollment. So the state funds are getting spread, spread out across more students, which is causing some issues. And right. what's also slowly happening is a higher percentage of state funding effort is going into grant aid for students and away from direct appropriations. And for example, you have a state like Colorado now 
that funds entirely via vouchers. So basically like the Pell Grant, where the institutions only get money if they get students. And I think that's also a trend with monitoring and funding. Oh, that's important. Um, and that's pretty subtle too. Do you see uh, a lot of state funding, uh, Robert, going to uh, merit aid rather than needs-based aid? It, it's a fairly small percentage, but it's been growing slowly over time. And it's concentrated mainly in Southern states. The, the trend does seem to have slowed down though. And you have a number of states going more into need-based aid, if not just for middle-income families, for example, the Excel, Excelsior Scholarship Program in New York State. I think we're going to come to that. Um, but before um, I get to uh, interrogate you on that, we have uh, we have one guest who wants to join us. Uh, so please, Tara, if you could uh, beam them up on stage. And while we're setting that up, everybody, we have uh, a lot of discussion going on at least one chat room right now, uh, references to other articles. Um, so let's see. Ah, Rana al -Madin. I'm guessing there's a connection to Rayan al -Madin. Somewhat. <laughs> Very insightful. <laughs> That's right. I'm her sister who's totally not into academia or research or policy making. So my question might sound very to most of you, um, but I'm curious to know from uh, Rayan and Robert, what you think is the first step? What, what would you wish the first step to be um, in, in, in creating um, practical change towards uh, solving these problems of getting higher education um, accessible and affordable and sustainable on the long term for, for people across the nation? Thank you. Good question. This is a big question. Because of the relationship here, I'm gonna let Robert jump in first. Sure, so we, we have two big issues to grapple with in higher education. The first is the price tag of an education, how much students and families are paying for it. And I think that there's some movement about trying to address that, whether through some of the free college endeavors or even something like simplifying income-driven repayment plans for student loans. But ultimately, the big issue is what do we do with the cost of providing an education? Because if it gets more expensive to provide an education, anything to improve affordability for students will be difficult to sustain going forward. And yet we talk mainly about price because bending the cost curve, just like in healthcare, is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. It is, and it's not quite as appealing. That doesn't have that direct connection with people uh, who may be paying student loans. Um, do you, what would be the, uh, Rana's question was about the first direct step we could take. What do you think are the, are the first steps that higher education could take to start bending that cost curve down? I think we need to be willing to embrace perhaps some more online education. We need to think about what do we need in terms of facilities? And frankly, what do we need in terms of faculty? That the the model of faculty tenure is already under a lot of stress. And if you want to bring down the cost curve, it's hard to do so when you have a lot of faculty who are locked into positions for a long time. And there are good reasons for tenure, but it's something that I think will be increasingly politically difficult. And you're seeing public and less resourced private colleges slowly moving away from that model more toward at-will employment. Do you think See, Rana, you hit a fantastic topic here. Um, I noticed, um, and this is for both uh, Robert and uh, for Rayanne, that in, in the report, a lot of the leaders mentioned the cultural difficulty in changing higher education, and they found a lot of that difficulty rooted in the faculty culture. And I think part of that was about tenure, um, but part of that was also just about attitudes. Um, I have to ask, that, that surprises me a little bit since the majority of faculty um, are now not tenure track or even tenured. Uh, the majority of faculty are now either term appointees or, uh, or uh, semester uh, adjuncts. Is this still an issue uh, when we have the majority of faculty who no longer have the shield of tenure? So, oh, sorry, Robert, were you gonna answer that? No, you go right ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that uh, your question, Brian, actually brings up uh, two points I'd like to make. One is, so when you ask this question, I think um, there's 
we have to keep in mind that there's very different sectors, very different types of institutions. And this has actually come up a lot in our surveys and in the reports. So designing these surveys is actually very difficult because we've got folks who are at community colleges or community college systems and they're, what they grapple with, the, the structures, how their systems work, the funding is very different from you know R1 institutions or liberal arts colleges and how they get impacted by something such as the Excelsior program is extremely different, different as well as well. And therefore the solutions are not uniform either. Uh, and that's why that's a, a, the, the question that my sister Rana asked is a very difficult one to answer, but that the answer, there's multiple answers. And the, and the, I think the key is to have solutions in multiple areas working together. Uh, and part of, I think one of the challenges is that the higher ed education community as a community uh, might not quite be aligned in terms of its values and its goals, and then align those goals with what the public needs or wants or values in higher ed. And so that's one piece I think that is uh, that needs to be answered. Another small piece I think is there's also room just in terms of bending the, the cost curve. Uh, one of the pieces of the multifaceted solutions um, can be found in technology. I know that this might be a little bit cliche, but there is room for technology to make to um, to make some improvements and scale up improvements. Uh, this is not necessarily for access. What I'm thinking about, but for example, the role in using um, predictive analytics in targeting student supports and targeting retention grants for students who are about to graduate can really help with um, retaining students or so helping them graduate on time. And that can save students and institutions a lot of money. Uh, so that's just one little piece, but when we put the different pieces together and what we know, um, I think that's kind of when the solution begins to, to take shape. And I think another fundamental challenge is even though families are becoming more sensitive of the price tag, they still want services that tend to be more expensive. And this is particularly true for the, the residential four-year sector where they want nice facilities. They want small classes taught by full-time faculty, but they want someone else to pay for it. So it's a fundamental well, challenge. Well, speaking of somebody else paying for it, uh, let's, let's come back to the, uh, uh, the state question again. Uh, I saw that in the report, uh, a major, major topic that came up under that header uh, was the New York State uh, Excelsior project. The Excelsior, well, I, I won't call it a grant. It's a uh, well, program is really the best term. Um, yeah, because it, it's a scholarship with strings attached. Uh, and I, I think you said that the respondents were mixed. Uh, and in part, they liked the idea of New York State putting its money behind this. On the other hand, they didn't like some of the strings attached. Can, can you say more about Excelsior? Absolutely. So, uh, as you said, this is and this is not the first time that the topic of you know quote unquote free college and I put quotes because some will call it say that it's not free college because it doesn't cover other costs such as books right. and, and fees and so on. Um, this is not the first time in a report that respondents are sort of are divided. I think. Um, and there's also um, some blog posts by some of our panel members, uh, Professor Alexandra really? Logue and, uh, and uh, former um, Undersecretary um, Jimmy Ann Studley, who wrote some really good posts about this and say a little bit more. But the idea is that in, in theory, the idea of free college, it's open to all. It sends this message that everyone is supported, that everyone is expected to attend college. It's a public good, that that message sounds really good, but then the execution of it can be very challenging or problematic, especially when there's li there are limited funds. And for the Excelsior in specific, because there are certain um, requirements such as 30 credits, 30 credits at college level courses completed each year. Um, that's just one of them. There's also the income kind of uh, restriction is quite considered high by some where they, they would rather see it targeted to the neediest students. There's the residential um, requirements. So if a student participates in the program for three years, for instance, they're expected to live and work in New York for three years after that, but they may have uh, much better opportunity somewhere somewhere else, even if it's just across the river. And so then it turns into a loan, uh, which really defeats the purpose. So there's a lot of these little pieces. And as you said, the, the respondents tend to feel differently. For some, the requirement made sense. If you're going to invest state money, then the state should reap the benefits of the student who's getting the education. And yet what happens to the student? How do they improve their lives? And so there was just, it's, it's, it's a very, I think a very difficult, uh, very difficult topic to get consensus on. It is, and, and this is just one example of state uh, public or state free tuition. And I think there's an even bigger. 
I think there's an even bigger debate going on about the idea of free college, that are we comfortable directing resources to families, say, making $80,000 a year, where the lowest income families are probably getting nothing additional from this program. Their tuition was already free, even if they didn't know it. So it ends up being a trade-off between giving money to higher income families and getting more right. low income students into college just because they're aware what the price tag actually is, not that they're actually getting more money. Right. So why not direct those funds that are going to the to the middle income student to supporting the lower income student who, even though their tuition is already paid for, will struggle to cover books, tuition fees, um, other crisis, managing crises in their lives and sometimes food and housing insecurity, as we know. Absolutely. You could, go ahead. You could certainly do that, but then does the program get as much attention if the income cutoff is, say, 60000 a year versus 100000 a year? Right. And when you have a governor who's thinking about running for president, that introduces a different set of dynamics as well. It really does. Um, and uh, the, these are huge, huge issues. And we had uh, Sarah Goldberg grab on uh, a few months ago, um, and she was talking very passionately about the importance of food insecurity. Uh, as well, and, and the impact of, of fees, textbook costs, and above all, room and board have. Uh, and to come back to something else that you mentioned, Brian, the, the 30 credit hour uh, a year requirement, uh, she points out that well, a lot of these students can only be part time, um, not because they're lazy, but because they're working or they're supporting family or both. Exactly. Um, so, so this is a this is an interestingly limited form of Excelsior. Is, you know, there's a cliche that every American state is one of the laboratories of federal democracy, and we all try different different projects, and this is one. Uh, Paula Smith-Hawkins um, mentioned uh, that she wanted to hear more about free college. Uh, Paula, I, I hope this helps. If you'd like to pursue this with more questions from our guests, please uh, chime in uh, using whichever means you have. Um, we have still more questions uh, from, uh, from our participants, and let me just walk us back to the online education world. Uh, this is uh, from Nancy Gibson, who says, I've heard that online education is not as inexpensive as initially thought. How does online education compare in terms of facilities costs for face-to-face? -face? And I guess, Robert, you get to take the first dibs at that. It seems like if it's on a fairly small scale, there is not savings. And the research tends to back that up. But if you can get large scale and you can get to where you can have a smaller number of faculty monitoring students, so thinking about, say, an Arizona state model, then it can become a, a revenue generating enterprise for a college. But the challenge is being able to absorb some of those losses while you try to get this thing up to scale. So by larger scale, it's you know, online allows, in theory, uh, a greater ratio of students to instructors. It, it can, yes, but but the upfront investment for the infrastructure can be pretty high. Right. right. Yeah. I think that's what infrastructure. Oh, sorry, and, just, and, and part of the infrastructure is the time commitment of the faculty and people who are developing the curriculum, not just the technology in those pieces, but the time commitment is a challenging one. And so if it can be sustained and there can be large numbers of students taking those courses over time, uh, the investment ends up being worth it. Um, but like Robert said, when it's small scale, I think the cost, especially the human kind of the labor of faculty can be quite large. Well, that connects back to two earlier points you've made. One is the question of faculty culture or faculty resistance. And the second is, you know, financial stresses in higher education in general. If we're asking colleges and universities to make an investment when they are cash poor or cash stressed, that can, that can be an issue. Uh, before I go down that road, though, we had another question. Uh, this is from Phil at UT Austin. And Phil says, there hasn't been any discussion about different endpoints Higher education views the only appropriate level of achievement as an associate's degree, a BS, or BA. But that structure was from a time when higher education was a one-time event, not lifelong. There's no question mark at the end of that, but I think that's a very, very important observation. Um, do either of you want to take a crack at it or uh, relay part of the study towards it? Sure, I can talk a little bit about this, that definitely, there's definitely as, as things are changing and, and 
people consider themselves long lifelong students and we have the kind of quote unquote new traditional student who's no longer the student who comes in straight from high school does four years and moves on there's definitely a lot of shift i think there's still um a, the, there's still, I think in the labor market and in people's minds, there's still a focus on an actual degree and the benefits of the degree. And we know that the degree itself can have some good um, benefits to students, but definitely there's a shift in the conversation in terms of credentialing. And this is why I think that kind of micro, micro -credential, credentialing, digital badging, all of those are really kind of surfacing and uh, gaining attention. Institutions are starting to use them. Employers are starting to use them. I do think we had a question about that in our survey. Uh, and at least the experts that we surveyed, well, you know, many come from uh, more kind of established institutions. So maybe they're not thinking quite in that, in that way just yet. They did not consider it as impactful. It was um, quite low on the list in terms of its impact. Uh, but there's definitely a movement in that direction. I think if you look at uh, perhaps when we survey community, more community college folks, that one would have maybe come up more in the list as impactful. Did you see any interest sure. in micro-credentials from the respondents, uh, badges or, or stackable credentials, that kind of thing? I'm sorry? I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Robert, uh, but along the lines of this, did you see any interest in micro-credentials uh, in badges or stackable micro degrees from any of the respondents? Or was that just not so, on the table? So that was one of the items in the survey and it was not uh, considered as especially impactful. A few, a few folks, a few respondents singled it out and said that they're using it and it's very useful and they see a lot of promise, but overall that was not emphasized in the report at least or in the survey. I think Robert was, was disagreeing with something. Please. Well, I, I, I think the, the growth right now is it's in the, some of the vocational fields that may require an associate degree, but there's also a fair amount of growth for people who already have bachelor's degrees and are getting these micro-credentials to signify additional skills. And then some right. colleges are starting to build these certificate programs that may eventually layer onto a master's degree. And frankly, colleges look at this and they see dollar signs in graduate education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also a little bit field the a little bit field dependent. I know that in the you know the in the allied mm -hmm. health, for example, the stackable credentials and certificates can play a very large role. You stack them up, but even before you stack them, adding those credentials will actually change not just it's not just signaling something to your employer and you might get a raise that you're moving forward, but it actually gives you new skills that move your position forward in in the hospital for example or or at the clinic where you're working so it's also a little bit field dependent i i from my uh, limited knowledge in the area that the field of allied health has benefited the most from this and other fields might follow allied health is very very large and growing uh, nationwide um we had a, a video question from greg shuckman if we could bring greg up on stage to join us that would be great now, when I when I say that, I'm always afraid that I'm going to jinx it. You know, someone will have just stepped out for coffee when I say that. So. Well, we're good, Brian. Hello, Where Greg. are you? Good. Where say, are you? I'm in Where Maryland. Unusually temperate day, so I'm enjoying the fish. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy. Enjoy. So, so I enjoyed scanning the report, and I especially appreciated the observation about how there may be more liberal. Uh, panelists that are involved, but one comment struck me um, by a community college president saying that accreditation was ripe for a universal redesign. And I guess that was in response to your question about the ACICS uh, rescinding the, the um, accreditation. So I was wondering, since we're about to see the Higher Education Act reauthorization uh, introduced, they're expecting it, by the way, Brian, uh, perhaps on Friday that we'll see that bill in the house. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, and I, I can't imagine that accreditation isn't going to be an issue. So is that something you two can talk about? Good question. That's a great question. Thank you. And I'm, I'm a little envious of where you're sitting right now compared to my backdrop, but uh, I'll let that go. I so I'm, I'm just going to speak to what uh, what folks have said in the survey. Um, I don't have a lot to say about kind of what to expect um, on Friday, but uh, this was not just one, we highlighted one comment, but a number of individuals said this. They actually, in a lot of responses to these items about um, kind of 
uh, regulating the for-profit sector, folks responded saying, we really hope this is a signal of change in the entire system. And a big part of that was accreditation, changing accreditation and redesigning accreditation. And what uh, a number of individuals said was they wanted to really focus on that we need to really decide what are the outcomes that we care about and then design accreditation around those outcomes for students or out student outcomes at the institutions, at the institution level. And that's what accreditation should be <coughs> focusing on. So this is just me yeah. voicing what our respondents said in the survey. Thank you. Thank you. And Robert, I would you say that, that yeah, I'd say there's a, a lot of political pressure coming from both Democrats and Republicans on accreditation. Democrats obviously weren't happy with, with ACI, ACICS, one of the biggest for-profit accreditors, but neither party's too happy with colleges with five or 10% graduation rates getting federal funds. The challenge is that accreditors don't want to cut off federal financial aid by de-recognizing a college, because when they try that, a political leader steps up and tries to sue if the college is located in their district. I think there may be some movement about maybe allowing more competition among the regional accreditors. But we'll have to see what pops out maybe this week for Higher Ed Act reauthorization. It just seems to me like there's a, a collision course between recognizing micro-credentials and the accreditation system because the two seem to be, I don't want to say incongruent, but certainly there's a, there's a philosophy about how accreditation should be structured and it doesn't seem to lend itself to those things that are sub degree uh, credentials. Coding camps, I guess is a perfect example. I think in the report, uh, coding camps were seen as no, not so large uh, an issue as they used to be. Right? Well, uh, in the report, we, we talked about how the, that students can access federal student aid to cover, to, to attend these coding camps, which was not the case before. And so for a lot of, also a lot of programs um, are not eligible for financial aid. And so that adds another layer, layer of complexity, especially when you bring in the politics of kind of a big piece is, well, if there's financial federal aid going to that program, it gets a different type of attention. Um, but uh, the aspect of federal aid, students being able to access aid for these coding boot camps was not considered especially impactful. Part of it is because I think it, it's just, it's a small group of students who would benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And that is why, but in the, but the concept was, was rated rather positively by some. Well, thank you so much for a really, really good question, Greg. And uh, in, enjoy that uh, that bit of Atlantic sun while you can. Uh, we had a, a question from Paula Smith Hawkins uh, who wanted to know, this is an interesting question, I think, for uh, framing uh, your study. Uh, why are we concerned about income, socioeconomic status, with the free college policy proposals in a way that we don't discuss with K-12? through Interesting question, Paula. That's a, that's a really good question. I think at least maybe part of that answer is, was answered in the, in the survey responses is the idea of is post-secondary education a public good or not? Is it considered right. just like K-12 to or for some now pre-K-12 to that it's a public good, it's accessible to all, it's something that, that has to be provided for everyone or not? And I think a uh, link to that and to that answer, the answer to that question is if what is the value of your degree or whatever credential you receive or do not receive after um, going through post-secondary education. I think this is where there's some tension is that for some folks, they don't see a value or maybe that the benefit, the costs of a uh, post-secondary education are outweighing, um, are outweighing the benefits for some. And then for others, they see it very differently. And I think this is part of it is this, what is the value of it? And is it a public good? And therefore, if it's not a public good, then that is very different from K to 12, the discussion there. Yeah. I, I think there are please go ahead. Yeah, I think there are a couple of reasons behind it. One is just the price tag of the the policy. When higher education is one of the few flexible areas states have in their budget, usually K twelve is mandated by either the state constitution or by court cases. Higher ed's not that way. And there's also the issue of there, there's some resentment that if we're funding higher ed to large amounts, we're funding higher income students 
why should we have middle income taxpayers who did not go to college subsidize the children of wealthy parents? Right. And that's especially going to be a problem if we view public education as a private good uh, rather than as a public good. Um, well, let, let's, let's take this. That's a great question, Paula. And I think we have one more from you, but we have one from uh, Mark Carnes uh, who uh, addresses uh, an issue uh, from a different angle uh, with the report. Uh, Mark mentions that we've been talking about economics a great deal, which is vital, of course. Um, but we're, we're also assuming that financial considerations are paramount. Namely, that if we had enough money, college would be fine. Uh, but William Bowen at Dell's study crossing the finish line found that one third of students from the highest socioeconomic category in state schools failed to graduate. If a high proportion of well to do kids aren't graduating, doesn't that suggest we're overemphasizing cost factors? I've stunned you both. I'm sorry. Well, um, I, that's, that's a, that's okay. I, I would say that I mean, there, there's still some importance of the price tag given there are still disparities by family income. But if affordability was not a concern, yeah, not everyone would finish. And I think we should be okay with some people leaving college before they finish. They tried it. Maybe it wasn't for them. Or maybe they even just got a job. But I still am concerned about the disparities in completion rates by income. I, I agree with Robert, and I would say that we, I, of course, finances and economics are extremely important. And uh, also in the report, these came out as kind of the most impactful items and why we invited Robert to join us to share his expertise. Uh, just in the beginning of the report, though, we do ask, respondents do agree that addressing completion rates and the quality of student learning is equally urgent as affordability. So they see all of those as equally important and that need to be addressed just in the current moment. And given the questions that we asked, they focused a little bit on economics. But I also fully agree with Robert that uh, no matter what we do, there's going to be a small, hopefully a very small group of students who do not uh, complete their degree. And ideally what, what we would need to have is that to have um, an, an alternative for those students an alternative in terms of there's different types of credentialing that they can get or different types of supports to still being able to participate um, in the labor market in ways that are fruitful to them despite not having completed. Mm -hmm. This is really an issue for community colleges where for so many of them you have people who leave uh, without completing and in many ways they transfer to someplace else or as you say Robert they get a job and that looks to us like a, like a failure that they, uh, you know, they haven't achieved that, that terminal degree. Um, friends, we have uh, time for some more questions, and we have a stack of questions coming in right now. So the, let me just uh, let me turn to one of them. Uh, again, this is a, a follow-up from Paula Smith-Hawkins, speaking of, uh, of uh, credentials, where she wonders about uh, competency-based education, funding, financial aid projections, and challenges. So where did, where did the survey respondents see CBE added. Is that a major issue for them or, or where? So we did not ask about this in the current survey, uh, but we did ask about it in the past. And actually this was one of the top rated promising innovations, uh, I would say about just under two years ago in our first survey. We asked about some of the innovations uh, predictive analytics and these kind of intelligent adaptive learning systems such as CBE were uh, top notch in terms of promising for both for uh, reducing costs, but also mostly for improving quality of learning. I don't have information on actual evidence for how much they do that just yet. I don't know if Robert does. Well, there, there's not a lot of evidence in my view in terms of quality, but we also don't have a ton of evidence for much of traditional higher ed either. I, I view competency-based education much more as an access mechanism for students, that their alternative may not be an in-person institution elsewhere. It's probably nothing. And I think it has potential to help get students with some college, no degree across the finish line. And I think the funding mechanisms are starting to catch up. Although this case with the Office of Inspector General trying to find Western governors some crazy number, is a, is a concern that I think Congress will take care of. If, if we're turning to Congress for decisive positive action, or maybe a sign of desperation, uh, can, can, how, how would Congress take care of that? I think they, 
I think there's broad bipartisan interest in passing legislation defining competency-based programs can do this and still get federal financial aid. Okay. okay. What if there's bipartisan? Did you say bipartisan? I, I did. There are some bipartisan right now. left in higher education. Imagine. Imagine. Uh, well, I'm glad to have another bright spot from today's conversation. Uh, speaking of today's conversation, friends, uh, if your uh, mic and camera are functioning and you'd like to join us, you can either press the uh, raise hand button on the very bottom of the screen or the very right edge, click that join podium, and you should snap right up on stage if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to continue. Uh, CBE covers a lot of ground, but there was also more non-financial ground in the report. Uh, uh, towards the end of the report, there was discussion about non-economic issues, including uh, student protest, sexual assault, and uh, racial access to higher education. What are some of the main takeaways that, that you came from that part of the report? So I think, I mean, th th these are different points. There's definitely generally just a concern over students' well-being. Uh, and I think the, the question about uh, institutions working harder to protect students from sexual assault and working around that speaks to that piece of just concern for students' well-being and welfare and working on that. And that received a lot of uh, respondents thought it was impactful, it was very positive, it was long overdue and that there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I think the, the interesting one, perhaps not surprising, is the, the question around student protests and uh, comments around free speech. And respondents thought it was view this as very negative, the, the protests, and that they're afraid that institutions um, are losing, maybe folks or institutions are losing their ability to hear perspectives different from their own and marginalizing uh, either conservative views currently or just views that are different and that it harms the mission of, the, of institutions and it harms student learning because of not being exposed to diversity and that they're afraid that um, Institutions perhaps are not as well or not well equipped to deal with this in the same way or how to help students, how to guide students to be able to have those conversations and listen to the other perspective. How do you guide protests so that you allow, because free speech goes on both sides. So you want to let the speaker speak, but you want to let students protest. How do you let student protest in a way that is constructive where everyone's uh, right to speech is still preserved. So I think it's a very, it's a very difficult topic, uh, but it elicited some very passionate responses about the importance of protecting free speech. I imagine. Good. Um, thank you. I get that. Uh, Mark Carnes, that goes back to your question in a different way about non-economic parts of, uh, of these conclusions. Um, we had a, um, this, again, if we have a chance to read the report, um, it's a very rich document with a lot to dig into. We had a question from uh, Kristen Eshelman uh, who uh, wanted to ask, in trying to understand the complexity behind the value of a degree, where do you see the most promising innovations in assessment? I guess, Ryan, that's a good one for you. Yes. <laughs> I think, uh, I think there's a lot of really good work coming out of the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, where they're, where they're really looking at this, uh, both in terms of uh, the value of the degree, but also the kind of jobs uh, that do not require a degree, kind of good sustaining uh, jobs. So I think that is a very good place to look at in terms of assessment of uh, very specific types of assessment nothing comes top of mind right now this is not something that i personally work in just yet more focused on the post-secondary piece but um it's absolutely crucial to be able to understand the value of the degree down the road and not just income uh and you know there's been a lot of criticisms about the gainful employment rule um and looking at income and the the time frame so when do you assess someone's income and uh, after having received a degree and whether that income makes it a valuable degree or not? And do you only look at income? Uh, do you look at what factors do you look at? Do you look at health? Do you look at well-being? I mean, it's so these are very d difficult decisions to make. And I don't think there's consensus yet uh, on those. But my definitely, I think, a livable wage. Uh, is important. I think some health indicators, well-being and happiness indicators, maybe not number one, but definitely should be in there. But which ones exactly, I can't say just yet. So I would put a plug in for the, the work that Gallup and Purdue are doing to survey alumni. And yeah. they have a national survey and then they have samples from different institutions that partner with them. 
And I think that's a fascinating way to look at then some of the non-economic returns to higher education. Excellent. Excellent. So those are two very powerful sources. Uh, in the chat box, we have Melissa Bender, who is just a fountain of links to uh, other resources. Um, she put up the good jobs data or uh, org site from uh, Anthony Carnival. Um, and the Gallup produced study is very, very important. Thank you. We're almost out of time, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, so I'd like to, before we close, to ask each of you, um, out of all that we've talked about, uh, all that all that we've seen and contributed to in the report, what are the findings that most um, heartened you, that most cheered you up, that gave you the best uh, optimism for 2018? Are you asking us, Brian, or the audience? I'm sorry. I'm asking, I'm asking you, too. <laughs> you can't read it aloud. It's just you. <laughs> Well, I will say, okay, so the most heartening, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think to me, it's it's really, it's no surprise, but I think the passion that the respondents that are the panel of experts brought to uh, their answers and the passion they have to serving students, the more, the largest group of students possible, especially disadvantaged students or less uh, represented or well-represented students, uh, to serving them and serving them better and um, overcoming obstacles that just this passion they brought to in their answers. And maybe that's just my perspective because I got to read all the open-ended responses to me. That's very heartening. Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah, it, I think it's a willingness to, to try new things that this is a group that has generally come through the faculty ranks, but they're, they're open to new ideas, recognizing that the higher education landscape is changing and they want to help drive the landscape in a way that both helps students and helps their institutions thrive and survive. That's a very, very different answer. Um, and that's a really positive one. We're going to be seeing a budding culture of innovation among academic leaders and, and funders and policymakers. Along with that, the passion shown by all of these people in uh, trying to improve access. Um, those are two really, really, really positive notes. Let me add a third uh, from the chat box. Uh, Professor Mark Carnes, who's not, who's, I think, Near both of you geographically, a fantastic professor and historian who we've had as a guest before on the show says that other point may be an upsurge in civic engagement, uh, that we have a new rebirth of life, a, a political life. Um, let me thank both of you. This is an important report. Uh, everyone, everyone involved in education needs to read it. And uh, I'm just honored and delighted to have had the two of you showing your expertise, sharing it with everybody here. Uh, and let me thank everybody as well for all of your fantastic questions and all your comments. Before you go, uh, where can we find you online? So first, Rayanne, where can we find you? You can find me on uh, Ithaca SNR's website, sr.ithaca.org, or you can email me directly. It's always great at rayanne.alamudin at ithaca.org. Uh, I'll also stick around for a bit after this if you want to just chat me. Uh, I'll be around for a little bit. And thanks again, Brian, That's for having us. This was wonderful. And Robert, for joining me. Oh, so I enjoyed the, enjoy the opportunity to be on. And you can find me. My website is robertkelchin.com. Makes things easy. And the title of your book is? Higher Education Accountability. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you both again. Uh, and, and you heard uh, Ren. She'll be here for a few minutes if you want to chat with her. Uh, let me thank everybody. And I, I hate to do this, but let me bump both of you off to one side just for one minute so we can put up a slide for where we're going next week. Um, again, this is just rich stuff, and I'm really, really glad we had a chance to dive into this. Um, next week, we're going to dive into particular technology with one of the leading inventors and innovators in the field. So if you're curious about blockchain for education, we have the CEO of a startup from Boston, uh, Chris Yeagers, who's going to be speaking about learning machines ways of using blockchain technology to support student records. Uh, so this is an exciting example of a new technology actually being used. So please bring your blockchain questions for next week. Now, in the meantime, uh, if you'd like to keep up with the rest of us, if you'd like to see where things are going or learn more, you should know that we're just finishing up our book discussion on Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Mass Destruction. On Monday, we published the notes about the very last chapters, the very last sections. It's a terrific book, a sobering book, an invigorating book. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, 
all those blog posts and all the discussion is there waiting for you. Now, if you'd like to uh, do still more stuff, you can go to ftte.us and learn about the future trends of technology education report, the next issue of which will be out next week. If you'd like to learn more about this technology, go to shindig.com. If I have to stick around for a few minutes, we can keep talking. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.